Hi everyone and welcome into Tap Into Your Creativity. I am so happy to be back. It's been a couple weeks since I've been here with you and I've missed you. And I can't wait for our interview today. I'm so excited to for you guys to meet Sergio. He has become a dear friend of mine and you will love, love to hear what he has to say. He is an incredible guy. Hola, Yael, I see you. Sharon, Carol, thank you all so much for uh, coming in live here. It's going to be a great interview. Uh, we're just waiting for Sergio to join us, and um, he is here, and he's going to join us any second now. So um, I'm just going to bring him in. Give me a minute. And um, he is going to pop up any second. So here he is. Hi, <laughs> well, how are you? Welcome, Sergio. I'm so excited that you're here with me today. Welcome to Tap Into Your Creativity. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for being here. And, uh, and now I, I, we, we have been together before, but it's been the other way around. So right. um, you interview me. And so now uh, I get the chance to interview you and, um, and give you the spotlight for a change because uh, you give the spotlight to so many artists and you've helped so many artists. And uh, it's nice to sometimes turn it around the camera and uh, tell us a little bit more about you and who you are and um, and uh, just welcome to the program and so happy to have you here. So Sergio, tell us a little bit about you and, and where are you right now? Well, first of all, Sandra, thank you so much for having me. Um, hopefully everything is working well and you can hear me okay. But Perfect. Uh, Excellent. Well, I'm super, uh, you know, excited, uh, like I said, because you have been doing a great job and really uh, also giving a lot of artists uh, the opportunity to be seen in your platform. So I'm super, um, you know, thankful for also this opportunity. I am based in Chicago land area. My studio is in Chicago, my home studio, which is where I am right now. I'm about uh, 30 minutes south of the city of Chicago. So I'm a little bit on the, uh, you know, in the south side, but um it's great. You know, I've been here since I was 16 years old, 1988. I grew up in Mexico City, came to Chicago, stayed here, uh, got married, had two kids, <laughs> and uh, and then the pandemic came, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but you're already in the pandemic. We missed the whole lifetime of you. So hold on for a second there. We're both Chilangos because we're both from Mexico City. That's what we call each other. And, right. uh, and so that's why we also have so much in common. And, and, um, and I, I love bringing borders together. Um, yeah. Like we say in art, there's no borders. And, um, right. and, and we bring, I try to bring in my platform artists from all over the world. And uh, we all have so much to say and inspire. And I know you're one of them. And so. So, um, exactly, Orgullo Chilango, exactly. One of the funny things, Sandra, is that, you know, uh, in Mexico, so I grew up in Mexico, right? I was 16 when I came here, so I was a teenager. In Mexico, I never really thought about becoming an artist. I thought about becoming an architect. That's kind of like what I really wanted to do. Uh, when, you know, when somebody asked me when I was a kid, you know, what would you like to be when you grow up? I usually thought, well, maybe an architect or a graphic design or something like that. And the reason is, although I love, you know, art, I had never done painting. I always done just, you know, drawings as a kid. And I didn't really know that you could be a living artist because all the artists that I saw back then, they were all dead. You know, Diego Rivera, <laughs> Frida Kahlo, <laughs> all the big muralists that I would see in Mexico City, these beautiful places, Siqueiros, you know, those are the people that I really admired. I studied them in art, in, you know, in, in school. Uh, but I never thought, you know, you could actually become that. So when I came to Chicago, uh, the funny story is I came when I uh, was 16. It was my uh, junior year in high school. I came in towards the end, so I didn't know anybody. Everybody already knew each other. They all had their friends. Uh, and, um, you know, it was kind of really awkward to start the year where everybody knew each other. And I didn't know English pretty, you know, hardly any, just a little. So... Uh, the one thing that I knew was how to draw. So the first thing I look at, there was an art club. So I said, I want to sign up for that. And uh, what I did is I just spent all my time drawing in art school. I mean, in the art class in high school. And then when I got to my senior year, my high school teacher, Mr. Larson, which I owe him, you know, 
the beginning of what I ended up being. Right. I said, hey, Sergio, why don't you, uh, or how do you consider an art career, becoming an artist? And like, well, I don't know. And like, I didn't even know how to apply for college. My parents didn't know either. You know, we were immigrants. Um, we came because my dad's job transfer was here to the United States. And, uh, you know, they were also trying to, to get used to this new thing. We didn't know how to apply for anything. So he said, he said uh, well, Sergio, there's a, a junior college nearby. Why didn't you go there? You know, I think it would be a great introduction for you. I'll, I'll help you, you know, with the paperwork and uh, see if you like it. Well, the story short is that I loved it. I took every class that they had at junior college. I finished with more credits than I needed because I wanted to take every single art class from jewelry to graphic <laughs> design, to painting, to drawing, to, you know, sculpture, you name it. And then I transferred there to the School of the Arts in Chicago, where I uh, then had a chance to really study painting uh, more formally. And then I transferred to another university south of Chicago, it's called Governor State. Uh, to do my uh, Master of Arts. That's where I met my wife. And then later I did my Master of Fine Arts in Northern Illinois University. So that was kind of like the jump in transition. But I would say, you know, it all started with, with just me just wanted to maybe do something creative, but not necessarily as a young person knowing that I wanted to become an artist, right? Um, right but I always right. had like an entrepreneurial mind too. So... So when you're 16 years old and you're still in Mexico and you're exposed to so much art, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, there we have so much amazing artists um, and art and history in Mexico. And as we were children growing up there, mm -hmm. we were exposed to all of that. Um, mm -hmm. I also was a daughter, is a daughter of... Uh, an incredible architect, I would say my dad is an incredible oh, nice. architect. Uh, how, how and so <laughs> I was also exposed as a young girl to see spaces and um, learn to see uh, creative uh, ways of solving space problems. And we would also have all that. And so, um, you know, so all of, of the feelings, the textures, the smells that we grew up in Mexico with, um, as an immigrant into the United States, we bring it with us. So we have that um, in, you know, in our bones, uh, very much so of who we are. And so I don't want to talk about exactly what you feel, but that's how I feel. I tried to bring, you know, my Mexican roots um, with uh, so much proud uh, uh, and, and feeling everything that I actually feel, right? So, um, and and be like I said, and being different, that also is a good thing sometimes, you know, <laughs> that we don't fit the mold, right? We're kind of, right, like this, right. we bring a little bit of everything. So um, after you decided to go into fine arts, and you decided to really dive into it, because then you went into your master's degree, then what happened? Now you have this degree, now what happens with you? That is the great question because I asked that myself, you know, I finished school and I said, okay, now what? How do I become an artist in the world, right? Because, you know, uh, I don't know uh, for many of some of our friends who may be watching, if you went to art school, what you went, you learn about your art, how to think about your art, how to talk about your art, you know, uh, all the philosophy and things like that, ideas behind your art. But really you talk about, at least not back then, now it's, it's getting better, but back then, you didn't talk about a whole lot about how to be an artist in the world, you know, how to live out of that. So that was one of our biggest questions that I had when I finished uh, my MFA, like, okay, so now what? So something that I, it's a parallel that I always love to do was technology. I always love uh, working with computers. And uh, so I knew how to do that, you know, how to use Photoshop and back then was PageMaker and things like that. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to at least start as a graphic designer and then see what happens. So I started working um, I got married, of course, and I started working as a graphic designer. And uh, in that search of, of working for that, I kept making paintings and I kept making art. And that's a, a season of my life. It was about, about one year, uh, which uh, it's kind of like my darkest seasons as an artist because I wasn't happy, right? I was working as a graphic designer. Uh, for long hours and I was sucking up all my time, all my energy, my best ideas were given to, you know, to that job. 
and uh, I would make art in the garage, and uh, I just I just didn't like it. Right? I just didn't I just didn't it just didn't feel um, like it was really what I wanted to do. So it was it was really difficult season. But once past that, something that I've always loved to do is I always had like these entrepreneurial ideas. So I've always been interested of not only how art is made but how it enters in the world. What happens with that art when it's in the world, right? So I, I thought I would really love to open my own art gallery, but uh, there were some problems with that. I had no money. I had never run a business. <laughs> I never took a business class in my whole life. And I didn't have any rich friends or parents who would give me money to start. Right, and, exactly. and, I, had no, and I had no connections. So five big obstacles. <laughs> had no connections in the art world, anything like that, just my buddies from school. So I did what I normally do when I want to start something and I don't know where to start, I, I called people. And I called four of my friends, the three of my friends, so there were four of us, and, and I said, hey guys, uh, do you want to open up an art gallery with me? Uh, it could be a collective, you know, we, let's see if we find a space, we can also make it into a working space so we can work there and have a section for gallery. And, um, and so they said, yeah, let's do it. So uh, we started thinking about ideas. Uh, we, you know, we started flipping coins. What are we going to call it? That's the first thing. What's going to be the name of it? So we ended up with the name 33 Collective. Uh, not because there were three 33 artists, but because at the end of like long conversations, you know, we figured out that we were all 33 years old. <laughs> so, <Huh. laughs> it. And it first started as a collective. You know, it was a kind of a co-op space. So yeah. So that's, that problem was solved. Okay, so now we have a name, let's register. Uh, then the next problem is, okay, where are we going to open this thing, right? Where are we going to be? So again, I did what I always do when I start, so start calling people out. Just put in the word out. There, right? That's how I believe you solve problems. If you just wish for things, never happen, but you just got to put the word out there. So I started calling people. I called a friend who I went to school with, her name is Rosirkovic, who she was a successful art appraiser uh, here in Chicago. And uh, I said, hey, Ruth, you know, I'm, looking to open up uh, an art gallery, but you know, I don't have space. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations? You know, the places that we have seen are super expensive. We can't afford it. We don't have money. Uh, you know, we just graduated. So uh, she says, well, call this number. The Joe brothers uh, just purchased this 80,000 square foot facility in the South Side of Chicago. Um, a little bit of a parenthesis there. The Joe brothers are two very well-known international Chinese artists who came to Chicago in the eighties. They here and they made a successful international art career so they, they they're they very well known in chicago yeah and around the world and around the world yeah Correct. yeah but particularly in europe uh, they do a lot of shows in europe and asia um so by then they were already internationally known um so by the time i got uh you know she gave me this number i i was afraid to call him like you know these guys are famous you know they don't know who i am why would they <laughs> even pick up the phone but i called and they said, yeah, come and take a look at the space. So I went and with my another one of the friends and um, Javier and I we went, we walked in the, this empty, massive space. And um, the your brother said, well, this is kind of like we want to do. We want to create an art center here with you know, a home for artists, with artist studios and galleries and so on. So we really loved that idea. And we said, sign me up, you know, where do I sign, right? So we signed the lease. And uh, we helped start the first Third Friday opening that uh, we had at the Joby Art Center. So that's where we opened the gallery. This is, um, tell me just how many years ago was that? That was in 2004, November 2004. So about 16 okay. years ago. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and since then, since that November, we have done Third Friday openings with thousands of people coming um, until the pandemic came, of course. But uh, <laughs> it's, been, uh, it's been really fun um, to grow then the business of, of the gallery figure now as i was working you know how do you run a gallery so i look for mentors people who already were galleries and um uh you know i met with them and they they gave me ideas and i, I, will, I will always look for um again people right it's always about people anything that i want to do right it's, it's about people it's about 100 percent. it's about you know, connections people. it's about putting yourself outside of your comfort zone it's about asking and getting, you know, you can get a lot of no's, but the one yes right. could be amazing. Right, exactly, exactly. And and uh, and um, asking in a way that uh, that is humble, that say, you know, I don't know how to do this. 
but maybe uh, you guide me or you tell me, tell me at least where, in what direction to, I think a good mentor is not the one that's going to give you the answers, but it's one that's going to show you, a, you know, a direction. Then it's exactly. up to you to go and take it and take that. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so, so now you have a space and now you do your first opening mm -hmm. and now you have a big responsibility, you know, not only as a art gallery, but also uh, now you have a rent to pay. So now you have to be conscious about, you know, making it successfully monetary wise um, so it can stay alive. So, so how do you do that? At that point, 16 years ago, I mean, you started that, but then like now you're here and now you have to make it sustainable. Right. So the gallery evolved over the years, right? So as I said, it started as a co-op, was 33 Collective. Then about five years into it, um, you know, you know, talking to my friends who started the gallery with me, we had a conversation in, in which the reality is that I'm the one who really loved the business part of it. Um, and so I took full ownership of the gallery. So we rebranded it. Now uh, it's under my name and my wife's name. So okay. from 33 Collective became 33 Contemporary Gallery. Okay. Uh, what it used to be a partnership, now it's all proprietorship, you know, from us. Um, and we we kind of ended that in really great terms and that, you know, nobody got upset or anything like that because it was it was the end of a season. Right. And recognizing, you know, what, what do you want to do from this point forward, right? Where, because having a show every month is a lot of work. It's a lot, a lot of, of work. Up, which yeah. takes you away from this, right? From, from your art. So unless you are really passionate and you really want to do it, you should it, right? Um, because. So how did you balance it out? And how did that come successful while you were trying to paint also? How do you balance that out? So when we started as a co-op, we would all pitch in, right? At the beginning, uh, because we didn't have like, we didn't come in with cash up front, like normally you start a business with, you say for a while, and then that's how you start out with it. We started with nothing. So uh, we started as a co-op in which we, each one, we uh, paid for the rent equally in four parts, right? And that's how we started. Now, by the time we got to the five years and I took ownership, then I started changing also the concept of the gallery slowly, you know, trying different, different ideas, different ways of working. Uh, also, we did uh, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of stuff with the jury shows, with the solo shows, with the group shows, with the call for artists, with it, uh, all these things. And then eventually, um, you know, as you grow, you know, you become more recognized, more established. So then, so then more people begin to trust your curatorial eye and the things that you are doing uh, enough to do so. Now, fortunately, for example, for us last year, before the pandemic came, um, again, so it's all about partnerships and looking for people, right? Partner with uh, Poets and Artists Magazine and Didi Menendez, who has a, also a great, amazing community of artists. So we partnered together in business with the gallery. And we said, we're going to, because most of the buyers for the gallery, anyway, they're not from Chicago. Uh, because of the internet, they're everywhere. Right. So it's a, Which is it's amazing. A, yeah. Yeah. We said, let's work online. Let's put all our eggs in that basket. Because <laughs> we believe it's the best, you know, we believe it's the future. I think you saw into the future. Tell us the yeah. truth. You can actually read of what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But we knew that it was the, it was the thing, right? And, and you could see it coming because... Um, you know, when RC opened up to galleries, right? RC, the online platform for yep. other galleries internationally, um, you know, galleries started to join and became really serious about that. And then RC began to experiment with, for example, uh, at the beginning, RC was just for inquire. If you had a gallery, you were in RC, you could only inquire about art. Uh, but then they started experimenting with, with buy now. See if collectors would actually trust the buy now online. And they did, to their surprise, you know, they started having amazing sales. So now they had the inquiry. Then they started testing also with online auctions through RC. Then they started testing with uh, also um, uh, offered, make an offer, you know, where if the gallery wants to put an right. artwork and make you put an offer, you know, you could that. So all those are variations that if you see, you know, the market, how it's moving, you realize that, you know, people are going in that direction. So um, Didi and I, we said, you know, we had to really, um, work this out as a, she has a very good business mindset and, and so am I. So I said, we're going to put all the eggs on that basket. We'll still have shows, of course, but we'll promote everything online. We'll do online marketing, uh, magazine ads, Facebook ads, you name it. And, uh, and we run it like that. And uh, we started selling it really well. Then the pandemic came, stopped all shows. 
but fortunately we already had everything set and uh you know i'm happy to say that since january sales continue to go up even in the middle of the pandemic so um we have an inventory of about 1800 artworks right now uh, from artists uh, from around the world we focus on figurative representational art that's our that's our niche right where we want to focus on where we have the collector base for that mm-hmm. and um and and that's what we're pushing um as a business idea and uh, it's working it's working really well we're really excited and what excites me most is like when you sell a work of art right as a gallery so because i'm an artist too i understand that when we sell a work of art from an artist that money is used for the artist to make sure that the artist can continue working can pay the rent can uh, you know buy their supplies that they need can do the things that they need to do that most artists when they get paid from a painting or drawing or sculpture they don't put it in the bank for later they need to use it right now. right and, and, that and, is- and it's so true and i think that you know i think that you know you saw it coming but now it's like this is the way of the future right. like you know the, the way of it uh, now. You, yeah the way of it now it's yeah. like you need to have a portfolio um mm-hmm. that's online you need to ha- work um you know find this time to actually if you're an artist um make a body of work and make sure that you have that ready to go and have it you know in a form that will um either a catalog, um, internet catalog, or printed catalog that you are able to send to the galleries, uh, make your proposals, um, work on all that. uh, Because I think that moving into 2021, um, you know, it will be very virtual. Um, A lot of things will be very virtual. I don't want to take away the importance of still being present in a gallery, Mm -hmm. um, because I think that still has and and tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that still has a lot of value, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have no plans of closing my gallery anytime soon. You know, galleries will still be around. Art galleries, I think what's happening as the world continues to open, we're not going to forget about online. Now it's an add-on component. Right. Uh, whereas a gallery has physical programming and online programming, sometimes running simultaneously. So you can have as a gallery now a show that's in your gallery and three or five shows that are online. Exactly. So your exposure now is duplicated in an enormous way, where before you only focused kind of on the physical show, the online was for promotion. Not right, anymore. right, exactly. So, um, so we'll come back because you have so much information that you still need to give us. But for right now, let's take a pause and you're going to take us around your studio, which is at home. And he's <laughs> never done this before. So right. I am so excited. Thank you for sharing this secret with all of us. I am excited to uh, for you to share. So if you want to take your phone and, and switch the camera and take us around, that'd be amazing. Absolutely. So uh, to kind of give an introduction into where I am right now. So this is the lower level of my home, the basement of my home. I have uh, my studio, which is about 30 minutes away. Right. And when the, pan- the, you know, with the big light and the big windows, but when the pandemic came, you know, I didn't want to be driving back and forth when, you know, all the family was here, my kids were here. And, and I'm like, well, I can, you know, continue working from home. I have always had this small space at home to do work uh, anyway, but uh, I kind of condition it now so that I can do everything from home. I can do my art. I can walk and do my video show. I can go and edit it. I have everything. with You have all your stations set up. Exactly, which is what I'm (laughs) going to show you right now. And a lot of artists have, and friends have me, so show me your, you know, your setup. And so first time I actually do it. So thank you, Sandra, for letting me (laughs) share here with the friends. Of course. Yeah, I'm so excited. (laughs) Thank you. So the first thing is for me, I've always um, need a walk. I work large scale. So I cannot have a space that has no walk. I'd rather have no windows but have walls. So uh, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's my, my yeah. thing. So, yeah. so here's the big wall. Uh, you can see that's my favorite chair, yeah. which uh, I've had it since I was a, a young um, you know, art student. A friend of mine gave it to me. So this is kind of like the about the size that I can fit, which is perfect for me because I have, most of my paintings are seven to, 72 inches tall. Okay. So, so this one is a 72 inches and uh, I can fit about three panels that are 42 inches each. So it still fits pretty good size. Yeah. Uh, it's really good. Yeah. yeah. It's not, yeah. A, it's not a, it's six feet, six feet tall. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And if I, and I, I believe it or not, I have done longer pieces, but what I have done is then I just roll the paper to the floor. Or as you can see my floor, you know, I, a lot, I do a lot of painting on the floor too. So typically in my paintings, they go up and down, up and down. Okay. Right? Okay. Kind of nice. And, and I see that that one is unstretched. So do you like working with unstretched canvas? Well, I'm going to show you for everybody. It's actually, this is paper. This oh, it's right paper. Here, what okay. you see is paper. Okay. And it is paper. Here in the corner, you can see it's paper right there. What kind uh, of paper is it? Um, this, this is mixed media paper, or sometimes I use Stonehenge paper, which is my favorite yeah. paper to use, printmaking yeah. paper, which I love it. So now it's on paper, and 99% of my work is done on paper, and then it is also adhered to canvas. So you will see actually the you know part of the canvas in the back right here that I will use for adhering it later. Okay. Um, and that gives it a resistance that I don't have to stretch. You know, to stretch it is super flat. All my shows have been done like that. Um, also, what is really what nice kind of glue? Is, what kind of glue do you use, or what kind of what do you use to 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 put it on top of the canvas? Just regular uh, gel I mean, medium. Oh. It. Just wow. dry gel medium, no water, just dry gel medium. No bubbles, huh? No bubbles. I've been doing this now for 19 years. So I got a really good now um, system on how to do it, uh, you know, so that it's perfectly flat. Doesn't matter when is, when is that big? Do you put it then on the floor? And yeah. do you uh, put something heavy on top of it? No, uh, because no. there's nothing that big that heavy, and you'll always have gaps <laughs> in between. So... Right. It's, a, it's pretty much is like once it's glued, first of all, the, the canvas has to be gesso, right? Yeah. The canvas has to be gesso, so it works out great. So canvas okay. has to be gesso, and then I gesso the paper too. Gesso has, the paper has to be heavyweight, uh, so you have less chances right. of, of ruining it. Right, 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 right. And then uh, once I, I do it in sections, but it has to be done fast. You don't want a section to dry. Once it's all flat and everything is glued, you take, uh, let me see if I have it here. Well, it's in my pile of stuff somewhere. But um, it's a, a, a one of those printmaker rollers. Yes. You know, a rubber roller. Yes, yes, yes. I have one. You probably um, have one maybe then somewhere, yeah. But you know yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So I take the roller. And... Oh, hold on. I think I have it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm looking for mine. Oh, I have one too here. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Say one of these. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Except a little bit bigger. You went for that. Yeah, like it's that. it's wider. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cuz that then, would take you a long time. It would take me 3 days. Yeah. So the, so then what I would do with that is roll that piece for probably about an hour until it starts to dry. The key that's the key because if you leave it you say oh it looks looks good, it looks dry, which happened to me unfortunately and I ruined a giant piece. You know, it looks great, so it looks good. You go, you have dinner when now you come back an hour later and now you got those bubbles that it's impossible to erase it's impossible to yeah it really is so then, once it's already dry do you stretch it then no you cannot stretch it actually oh okay uh, so you so just heavy. it's so heavy so how do you how do you present it or how do you just like that do you frame so, it what do you do so on my work uh you will see that when i make it i leave two inches all around Okay. So I would put grommet rings on each corner once it's dry. So these little things right here, I'll show you. Yeah. You buy in the hardware yeah. store. Yep. Tiny rings. Yeah. And it comes with a little tool that you can put them up. Super yep. easy. And, um, and that's how I do my pieces. Now, when I sell one of these for a collector, I have three options. I send them. I always like to give, because it's not the typical type of artwork. In right. How it's displayed. I always send them a file that I have prepared with like three different ways of uh, of framing the artwork if they want. So one is they can keep it as is, and some collectors like it just the way it is because it's super flat. And right. uh, right. the two inches border kind of gives it a visual border around it. And the reason I make it two like that is I like the idea that they, because they are the size of a, of a door pretty much. So they become like doors to another dimension, right? So sometimes if you overframe it, you kind of lose that. If the artwork was to the, you know, cut to the edge, right. you lose that. So I, I, it's, it's conceptually, I like that white frame. Um, so one is to keep it like that. Option number two is to mount it, which you can mount the piece to a board. Um, and 
and then give it a little off. dimension yeah exactly and the third option is to remove the grommets and then just have it totally uh, frame on a um, on a wood box okay um, you know yeah 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 or take it, some 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 of them take it to a professional frame shop and they will remove the grommets and then uh, trim it a little bit that's why i have that extra space and then frame it uh, right. but they don't need glass because uh even though it's paper the paper has been gesso uh has like literally sometimes hundreds of layers of paint uh you know in thin washes. yeah I, it must be so heavy <laughs> it's heavy and, and yeah. then it is and then at the end sometimes i put uh, also uh, an acrylic varnish if i want most of the time i don't but i, I can do that too right and, right and yeah you know just even to protect the it you want to protect the painting you want to protect it because you don't know if it's going to be near a window that has light and it needs the you know protection the usb protection and all that so um, you know, it's always a good idea to varnish and uh, just to, you know, just to make sure that, yeah. you know, the, the collector won't come back and say, hey. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What happened? Yeah. Let what me show happened? You my, let me show you my table and my tools here. Yes. So, yes. so this is where you'll see all the, uh, all my tools and paint brushes or so my paint brushes. I use like super old brushes. Uh, like, you know, some of these brushes are like 10. 15 years old and oh I, I usually use like cheap one dollar brush except for a few nicer ones yeah um, everything else you know i just like it like that um all my art supplies here colors things i've been testing this uh super black um you know black 3.0 which is supposed to be like the darkest black kind of thing and do um, you like it uh, the first test I did, it didn't give me the results I expected. So I called the company and apparently, uh, you need to use black 2.0 first and then put 3.0 on top for better results. Or Is it like a liquid form? Yeah. It's just like a liquid text. Yeah. It's just like liquid paint. Okay. Uh, but it's supposed to have no, um, so like 90% black, no reflection. Okay. So it looks like a hole. Oh, nice. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Where do and, you buy that? Uh, online. You can Online. just look for BLX okay. 3.0. Yeah, and they, okay. they ship it to you. Okay. So we play with that. Good to with know. that. You know, I also, so I work with acrylic. I also a lot of times use, you know, go to the hardware store and buy house paint too, if I want to test different materials. Um, if my, you're working with acrylic, toys. what is the best, um, <laughs> <laughs> what is the best house um, paint that you suggest? I have no specific <laughs> preference. I just go and sometimes whatever is on sale or whatever color I like, because, you know, every company has different colors. Right. So Anything yeah. but enamel, right? Because enamel and acrylic don't go. Right. I buy acrylic. Acrylic yeah. based. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that. Uh, then here is where I have my working table, uh, my charcoal uh, box here. I love charcoal. So most of my paintings actually start as a charcoal drawing. Uh, probably even on this one. Uh, you know, you might see some of the charcoal that I use for smoothing that black, for example. Yeah. Then I, I seal the charcoal with acrylic gel and then stays permanent. So do you use collage on that or is it stenciling? No. Uh, stenciling, which I'll show okay. you in a second. So, uh, you know, here's my toolbox. Here's actually the piece that I'm donating for uh, Oh, Feed my America. gosh. It's actually okay. The we need to talk about that for a minute. So um, for everyone that is joining us that didn't know before, but uh, tap into your creativity. Uh, we collect um, original artworks from um, this incredible artist like Sergio. And um, whomever wants to buy this incredible piece by Sergio today, uh, please uh, DM me or Sergio for details on it but know that 100% of the proceeds will go to Feeding America. And also, you should know that um, we have collected $17,750 for Feeding America, which is the equivalent of 177,500,000 meals. <laughs> it's That's like, amazing. That's incredible. It's, uh, it's incredible. So we are feeding a lot of people in need. And um, so if you please, if you um, feel that um, in these times of holidays and you feel like you want to help, please help us um, on this incredible project. And um, I will be turning on the comments um, at the end of the interview. So um, please 
Uh, we'll show it again. But Sergio, that is amazing. I love Thank it. You. I'm so, so excited about so, it. So this piece will be, uh, it's going to go up for $300. And all $300 full, full of it, 100% is going to go to Feed America, as Sandra said. And it's, a, it's, you know, it's really a, a nice opportunity to get one of these because I just did a release of a small series. I only do two releases a year and it sold in three days. Uh, sold it's, out it is days. unbelievable. So, you did 16 pieces and it sold yeah. out. I mean, it was incredible to see your process in, online and how you, how people really reacted to your beautiful collection and the support that you got um, and how it sold out. I mean, it is very inspiring for artists to see this. And I'm sure you feel that your heart is, is full. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. It was so amazing and incredible. So, uh, you know, they, I still had friends who said, hey, you know, I wanted to get one and I came too late. Well, you know, you still have this one, which is especially made for here for my show with Sandra. So, yes. uh, this, uh, yes. I don't, I'm I so don't excited. make small pieces. So most of my art. It's 11 by 14, <laughs> by the way, you guys. It's 11 by 14. Yeah. It's on paper, mixed media. So, and he finished it this morning. <laughs> yeah, right before we get to live. So you can still see my face. Right? <laughs> incredible. Just incredible. So, so you talk about the stencils. So I have a box of stencils that I've been collecting over the years. Okay. And I love the stencils as a way of, uh, you know, as a motif of repetition, right? Uh, and, and I like the idea that it's, it's a cheap stencil. It's, you know, the ones you buy at Michael's, right? Not, yeah. You know, for craft and things like that. You would decorate a chair or, yeah, or some, exactly. something super like that. So, but I kind of like that idea of bringing that flattened uh, dimensional space, uh, you know, into a work of art and then becomes, you know, fine art, you know, which is the thing that you would see there. And um, I, I really enjoy that. It becomes a veil also in a way, which is kind of a, what you see right here. It's a, different you know stencil marking and you know that the the red string that you have uh mm -hmm. that it's almost like a seam um that you have that you have it's it's so um effective because it is used uh in 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 a small amount, but in a perfect way of connecting the whole piece together. So you have, you know, the big elements, but then you have the delicate elements as well. So it just balances it out. And right. so it's, it's really, it's like, you know, it's like the cherry on the cake. Uh, <laughs> and it's that surprise element that you have. And I think as artists, we all strive to get that balance. Um, and get that language um, going. And you have, like you said, with the stencil, you have the repetitions, but you also have a lot of mark making. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you create that with your charcoal, you create that with, you know, with all the brushes that you like using. And, um, and, you know, you just, it's, it's very nice to see the veiling that you do. And like, mm -hmm. you see the figure, but is it there? Is it not there? It's very mystical. Um, right. So here you can see the process, right? Like all the pieces are like hundreds of layers of uh, of color, shape, you know, strokes, uh, lines, textures. And I just have fun with that until something uh, begins to happen. So from the series that I did, these are all leftover pieces that I didn't like, uh, which eventually maybe next series, uh, next year. If we'll I come back. <laughs> one, we'll come back to in some way or fashion. But I got to show you my my secret tool uh, of uh, that I've been using for the last couple of years for you know making the surface of my artwork is this old cell phone you know I, I think the cell, iPhone 1.0 probably <laughs> that it has really beautiful oh my god thank you you know it has round edges all around yeah so I love it because I can work on a surface and you know as I also go like this with it you know it doesn't leave a, a a marsh. An edge. Yeah, yeah, an, an edge. edge. So I love it. Uh, and That's so very if, creative. If I don't this, think I, I've seen any. I've never seen this before. <laughs> so if anybody <laughs> has one that you want to donate for, for me, yeah. Well, oh, my God. Yeah, I'm send it, send it Sergio's way. <laughs> it has to be the version one because it's the only one that has super smooth edges all around. That's amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. You use it like as a credit card kind of thing, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I go and, 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 and yeah, exactly. And, and I, exactly. I love that. So, so where this, do you um, tape your shows? So I'll take you there. 
Um, so here is another table where I do on my my right now I'm testing some prints. So here's that. Here's my catalogs. Um, you know that I do that. Um, books that I'm reading, books that I'm looking at. I'm always, you know, if I'm painting something. Oh, Gerard Richter. He's one of my favorite all-time artists. Right, Gerard oh. Richter. I love books about uh, artists in their studios. So this one's a great book it's called Artists at Work. It's a beautiful book of, uh, you know, artists working in their studio, famous artists. And uh, I just love it. It's great. It's just so inspiring. So I love that. Oh, um, I've never seen that before. I think I'm going to go get it. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of old, at least 10 years old, but it's great. Okay. Uh, another artist that I love is Enrique Martinez Celaya. Oh, I love him. Yeah. So Cuban he, artist. He, Mexican. and you know what? Mm -hmm. Every single thing that he says oh, yeah. is, is a quote. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's an incredible um, artist, but an incredible writer as well. He is right. just, he's amazing. I love all his art quotes and... Um, you know, I don't have his book right here in my studio, but I had it in my, yeah. in my, <laughs> in right. my home, which I love. There are the, those book. are the Zoo Brothers. The Zoo Brothers, yeah. Oh. The, this is their 30 year collaboration. They do also like giant paintings and they full do of giant, giant paintings. And, yes. And it's, yes. it's just beautiful. I, I kind of like, like to look at. And one that I was looking at this week, which is really cool. So I love technology is this one. It's, a, it's called Open All Day. It's a, it's a book of sketchbooks by two artists, Isidro Ferrer and Pep Carrillo from uh, Spain. So okay. this, book, this book is pictures of their, stu of their I mean, uh, sketchbooks. But the cool thing is that you download an app and then you point the phone to the page. And if the page has like this little icon, this stuff comes alive. It uses cool. augmented, re augmented reality. It is wow. the, coolest, the coolest thing. So you gotta download the app. I mean, I cannot show it because I'm using the phone, but um, like this, they will have something that comes alive three-dimensionally all of a sudden in front of you. It's incredible. It's crazy. Wow. And uh, I saw the exhibition here in Chicago, and I, I went and got Can it. Can you there. show us again the cover of the book? Yes, it's called Open All Day. Open All Day. Okay. Pedro Ferrer and Pep Carrio. Okay, I, I will, you know what, I can post it later too when you, you can yeah. send me a picture of it and I'll post it later. Okay. Yeah. Favorite snacks of all time? <laughs> <laughs> Are those for your kids or for you? <laughs> <laughs> That's not me, the kids don't come here. <laughs> so that now I'm exiting the studio and this is where I do all my video content, right? So here's a lower level. Um, that's a punching bag when you need to kick something, <laughs> right? Um, kind of like video projection oh. area. And then here's where it will be the studio for production. I mean, recording, uh, do all my recording podcast. here. Podcast, breakfast with Sergio show. We now we're 300 episodes. So, you know, I can do everything here. That's nice because I can just walk from the studio, do a video, get back. And then here's where I do all the editing. So have my computer here where I can sit down, you know, edit an episode. In the other screen, I can, you know, preview it and all that stuff. Wow. So, you know, you know, happens here. So it's kind of nice. Then I, again, I can um, work on. I a, mean, can you have podcast. another gadget? And then, boom! <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you have everything. That is amazing. Uh, are those lights? Do you recommend those lights? Are they soft lights so they're not too harsh on 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 you? Yeah, they're really great lights. Uh, I got them from Amazon. I think it was 150 bucks for the whole set. Okay. Um, which is great. Now, I got these uh, like a couple of years ago. They have now better ones. I'm thinking of replacing them with flat. Now there's flat LED ones that are yeah, better than I, this. Yeah, I saw those. Yeah, they're, those they are, look like they're great and they give an even yeah. lighting. Yeah. Yeah, these are nice because they diffuse the light really beautifully, but the other ones are more portable. So because I like to do some shows also away from the house. So, yeah. you know, I can easily pack them. And then just a backdrop from uh, Amazon. Again, it's just uh, I can swap different colors and things. And um, let, me, let me go back here. Um, so we'll continue from, from the studio section. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. It looks amazing. So, Sergio, like, can you talk to us now? I mean, you have a full life uh enriched by the arts in every way, shape, or form. And now you are in a position to give back and you are doing that. You have now an art academy, if you want to call mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, which is the art next level. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, 
Can you tell us a little bit about that and what are you offering and yeah. uh, how did that come about? So it, it came about really by a, um, kind of in a natural way, which is kind of how I like things to happen when they make sense. And as I continue, you know, as we talk about the gallery, continue working with the gallery, then in, 20, in 2010, I became curator for the Jovi Art Center in Chicago. So I started curating big exhibitions and um, so it gave me more visibility as well. Uh, and then slowly, you know, artists would come also to me for advice on, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? And um, I could help one person at a time, right, with my time and my time was limited. So how can we make this better? So uh, my wife, who is a psychologist, she has a doctorate in psychology and she was practicing for 13 years as a, as a psychologist. Um, you know, we always kind of envision maybe at some point we could work together, but we never thought about how because, you know, psychology and you know, fine art were two kind of separate things. Um, but um, uh, about six years ago, we thought, why don't we start something where we combine the wellness mindset component, which, you know, back then it started to become, uh, you know, something um, uh, that a lot of people were writing about and talking about and bringing the art business advice together, you know, because to kind of share what I didn't learn in art school, how to be an artist in the world today, particularly in a world that's changing every day. You know, just when you think, you know, Instagram, for example, well, two months they changed the algorithms and now it doesn't work. Yeah. Now you have TikTok, right? Now you have, you know, next, next five years will be kiki or exactly. something different. Right? Exactly, so, exactly. Uh, how do you do that? And I have a passion for education. I taught at the uh, university level also for uh, 10 years also. Uh, so, and I, we thought, well, why don't we create an online academy uh, where uh, artists can join from all over the world? So we did that. We started first with the podcast. And from the podcast, then we started creating courses. Um, so we have now tons of courses on all the areas of wellness, advice for artists, uh, exposure, mindset, marketing. Um, the only thing we don't teach is how to make the art, right? Because uh, that somebody else can do that. We want to, we had to focus on something. So we focus on business mindset, you know, the living of the artist, what, what you need to do afterwards. And uh, for example, what I did with, uh, you saw my um, small works, that was part of a small works challenge that I do every year, that, you know, to teach pretty much artists how I do it. And, um, you know, how I create the marketing plan, you know, the behind the scenes, which really is a 10 week process to get to this point where I was able to sell it all in three days, you know, uh, it does what I happens just right exactly it's not like you just did it and then you showed up and then that happened <laughs> exactly so doing things like that and always kind of thinking about how can i add more value how can i bring more information so that's how i started breakfast with sergio um two years ago because i didn't i didn't have a whole lot of time to do something else i was teaching full time you know besides all this and um, i quit already that but when i when i started breakfast with sergio the only time that i had was breakfast i said well i have breakfast uh, how about if I, um, uh, you know, I just click record and, and go live here on, on my show, I mean, on my phone while I have my breakfast. So that became breakfast with Sergio. And, um, and, you know, before I knew it, artists from all over the place were watching it, you know, as I distributed in all the social medias and all the platforms. And um, uh, so that's how I also get ideas of what artists need, because uh, you have to create what's going to help. Uh, not from my perspective, but from the perspective from all the artists who are also in, you know, in India or who may be in Europe or who may be in Mexico, right? H how do you uh, do that? And uh, so when I know there's a, a need for something, I go find resources, learn about it, try it myself, which is kind of what's also a uniqueness of the program where there's a lot of marketing, art, business programs, uh, but uh, I'm an artist who tries it first. And if it works, you know, I'll teach you how to do it, tell you how, how it worked or why it didn't work. Um, so everything that I teach has been tested, right? I didn't, I didn't start teaching artists the small words challenge until I tested it myself for five years straight. Um, now that I got the kings, I got a really good marketing, you know, plan behind it that I tested. It works. Now I say, hey guys, you want to take it with me? Come in right now. Um, you know, hundreds of artists are taking it, and they're launching their small works and uh, sharing what they're doing. And so that's kind of that. And, uh, you know, when I have also other ideas, like, for example, just two weeks ago, I like, what if I do a kind of an Instagram live, but I, I interview artists that they don't know that they're going to be interviewed. So that's when I started, like, the impromptu interviews with Sergio. Yeah, so I love just, it. I just go live and whoever shows up said, it's all about you. So let me, let me get to know you and interview you in the show. And so that's yeah. been fun. 
yesterday I yeah. think was episode three. I had already like five <laughs> artists who have showed up. We had an artist from India, one from Texas, different places. So those yeah. are the things that get me excited. I don't like to do something and and just do it forever, but kind of like thinking about what makes sense now, what's exciting for me. If I'm excited about it, I hope I project that excitement, right? If I'm not excited yes. about it, then it's time to end it and think of something else. 100%. And I, I, I think that like, uh, I'm going to turn back on the comments. I know someone said to turn them off, but I'm going to turn them on because we only okay. have 10 more minutes and I want people to ask you questions okay. um, if they have any questions. So um, maybe you can move a little bit, Sergio, on the, on the right side of the comments. So you're not right in the middle. So move, there you go. That's great. Because <laughs> okay. um, I think, I think the problem is that it goes right into your face. Um, ah. So, you know, I think that it is it is really heartwarming when you're doing something and you are so passionate about it that you are almost like it's a con contagion, right? It's like you want to um, inspire others and hopefully you, you know, you can teach and uh a lot. You have a lot to teach and we have a lot to learn. Um, in, in my case, I am passionate about tapping into your creativity. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's why it's been so successful because, right. you know, when you have that passion, it's like, wow, you want that, you know? Um, and so you want to grab it as hard and as much as you can. So Say, you know, putting that apart, somebody just asked the brand of the chair that you have in your studio, I guess. Oh, I don't know. A friend of mine gave it to me like some 19, 20 years ago. And uh, it's a rolling <laughs> chair, one of the high chairs that uh, it was probably like a bar chair. <laughs> yeah. And I like it because it spins and it's yeah. high. So I can yes. look at the artwork, you know, yes. from above yes. And, yes. and spin around. <laughs> yes. So my friend Sonia just said passionate and she is as passionate as you can get. So um, I, I love uh, that spirit. And um, so tell us like if if you are you have a body of work and now you're ready to go out to the world, what would be your first three tips that you would say to someone? Mm. Uh, yeah. So, if you know, once you have work through the the progress of making that body of work, which is uh, ideal, uh, you know, spend really a lot of focus and energy into that, devote your work to that. Uh, once you have that build up, or at least, you know, a 75% completed, I think that's a great time to start putting together a portfolio, a digital portfolio of that work, um, so that, you know, you can start then looking for opportunities with that, you know, with that body of work. And by that means thinking about what the work is about, thinking about, you know, uh, uh, how to talk about that body of work. So that's one of the hardest things for an artist to talk about our own art. And even for me, you know, uh, I love talking about an artwork that I have in the gallery, but when it comes to talking about my art, I have to think about, you know, quite a bit more because I, I'm, I'm too close to it, right? We are all too close. But starting thinking about that, writing, making... How many, uh, the, uh, a question is, how many yeah. pieces is considered the right body of work? Uh, you can do, you know, from 10 and up. Um, there's no specific number, but for example, as a curator for so many years, with 10, 8 to 10 pieces, I can already get a grasp and idea what that artist may be up and, you know, working at. Um, so that's a good, and also depends on size, right? Uh, you may have, you know, six, seven really large pieces that are really strong, and that is fine. That makes a body of work. Somebody may have, you know, 35 little ones, and that's also a good body of work. So, uh, it's not a specific magic number, but rather what's the idea behind those words? Um, how do they relate to each other? So start writing those things down. Because when you start writing all those things down, maybe in a journal or a notepad, you know, it starts giving you ideas. So then the next step will be, okay, now I have a body of work. I have already uh, thought about this. What's it about? You know, what connects them together? Now the next step will be, okay, now I can build a, a digital portfolio about it. So then I, then I can also show it to other people uh, and start with the people that you know. And then from that, then you can do what would be more professionally known as an exhibition proposal. You know, if you want to see this body of work in a show, in a gallery, museum, then professionally you want to do an um, uh, exhibition proposal because that a proposal is a professional way to ask for, you know, for an opportunity. Huh? But it all depends what you want to do with that, you know, with that work. You know, for example, the value of work that I did that I just saw, I wasn't looking for an exhibition. What I wanted to do is make it sell it uh, because uh, I wanted to get it out in the world 
it's fast. So I didn't do a bad uh, uh, proposal for that because that was mm -hmm. not a goal. So you got to know kind of what you want to do with that value of work. Where would you love to see that work? Would you love to see being sold right now or would you love to see it in a show later? Because, you know, they're two very different things where you have to do with that. So I think, Sergio, what we're going to have to do is do a part two uh, <laughs> because there's so much to talk about and so little time. Um, and uh, too much fun, too, too little time. Too much fun, too little time. So um, if you're up to it, we'll do a part two in 2021 um, yeah. with, uh, you know, with all of these questions in mind. How are we moving forward? Where is the best place to go? Um, and, you know, I don't think you have to have a story for each of your paintings. As a whole, you can have a story of your collection right. and where that collection come from. Right. Um, two questions. One was, uh, if you can remind us the name of the paint, the black paint um, that you used. Uh, yeah, you just want to go, it's black 3.0. You just go online. And, uh, and so we'll black 3.0. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment uh, here in the... After Perfect. The, the video, yeah. Comment below. Uh, Perfect. But it's like Black 3.0. And you just Google it, Black 3.0. Uh, it's a really yeah. nice website. They, they talk about how it, that is, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, yes, Susan, it is so needed. And uh, we will have a, a an episode, a 2.0 episode, Sergio and I. In fact, I approached Sergio and we're going to think about a way to collaborate in 2021 together. And um, so stay tuned for that. We are still in the very beginning of just thinking about it. So we might come up with a really cool thing. So, mm -hmm. um, but um, the other question that I saw was, um, do you uh, um, recommend a way of payment to the artist? Is Venmo a good way to be paid? What do you recommend? Yeah, so if you're going to sell your art online, for example, social media, uh, I pre it, it, you have to look at what platform you have right now. So let's say if you have your website with Wix or with Squarespace or with WordPress, you can see, okay, what uh, type of payments do they already accept, right? So, for example, I have Squarespace, so they accept Stripe and, uh, and um, PayPal. So that's what I use for my latest series. You always want to make it the easiest for the person to click and get it. If it's too many steps, you lose it, right? Because nobody has time, everybody's busy, as we all are. So you want to make it as easy as possible. Now, I've also sold a whole, you know, series without any uh, website intervention, just directly from DMs. So what you do is if you just open a, either a, a Venmo or a PayPal account, and you just send people to DM you, and then they say, if uh, Sandra wants to buy it, say, okay, Sandra, what's your email? I'm going to send you an invoice right now. And I, you just go to PayPal, you send the invoice, by email, Sandra gets it, clicks pay, and boom, it's done. So always a super easy way you can do it and uh, letting people know how, you know, they can get that work. It's very important. Your call to action, super important. I think a lot of artists don't sell art online because they don't, uh, they don't have a good call to action, you know, um, and, uh, you know. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. We have to do a 2.0 because we're two minutes out. And I want to show again the painting that you created for this. Oh, yeah. Um, so if you want to go get it and then stay where you are or you want to go with it, that's totally fine. Um, but uh, I, um, I can't thank you enough, everyone. Um, this painting is for sale today. And um, it's $300 that we're asking for this incredible artwork from Sergio. 100% of the proceeds will go to Feeding America. So that means 3,500 meals will be served if you buy this painting. So right. think about how many people you are helping and uh, just please, please, please consider buying this painting today. Um, Sergio, I can't thank you enough. You're amazing. Um, I'm so excited uh, that our, our paths have crossed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm excited for the future and um, we'll keep you guys uh, tuned for episode 2.0. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sandra. And I went, again, to, uh, to all the friends, if you want to reach out to me, you can find me at Sergio Gomez Art. If you're in the United States or Canada, you can text me at 708-627-9103. That's my texting platform. You can text me there anytime, day or night, and um, I'll reply to that. So thanks again. We'd love to uh, see you again. Thank you, Sandra, again for, for having me. It was really a pleasure. Thank you, Sergio, and uh, we'll see you real soon. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Goodbye. Have a good week.